right. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. This is our second meeting, December 9th, 2020. Uh, the uh, first two meetings were listening sessions. Um, last week, we had our first uh, session meeting with, um, with our community stakeholders and committee members. Um, I did a lot of talking in the last meeting because I just wanted to give an overview of of the size of the department um, and a little bit about uh, how we handle different things. Uh, but in this session, I wanted to really just uh, throw the questions out overhead to the, to the committee members uh, because that's what we want. We want to hear from, from you all as to what uh, what you think uh, we should be doing. And um, if you have any comments or, or questions for me related to that, then uh, I can jump in, but we'll probably go through the, the list of uh, committee members um, and then uh, ask for a comment. If, if you wanna pass on something then you can, you can pass on it. Um, but obviously your input is important and uh, I'd like, we'd like to know what, you, what you're thinking about it. So, uh, so the, the um, first question is, uh, what functions should the police perform and how, how should the police and community engage with one another? Um, I don't know if Frank Luis is on the call yet. Uh, he's our branch chief of Westchester County District Attorney's Office. Um, I don't know if Frank's on. If he's I am. Not. Oh. All right, Frank. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot then. Um, I, just in your opinion, uh, I don't know if you have anything to add on that question about what functions uh, the police should perform. And, uh, I, it's all yours. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I think obviously you have the traditional role of the police in ensuring the safety of the community, ensuring a way of life that the community is comfortable with. But over time, that's morphed. And now I think the reason these reform committees have started up is people want to reimagine and expand uh, the role of police within the communities to address issues that maybe weren't being addressed so well before. And I think because of that, um, and because of events that have happened across the US, you're now seeing this demand, this need to talk about what these new additional roles should be. Uh, I'm gonna go, if you're done, Frank, I'm gonna go to uh, Claire Degnan, if she's uh, from Legal Aid Society, if she's on. <clears throat> Hey, um, uh, Chief, this is Hussein el yes. Um Yeah, I have a couple of questions on this, if, if I could. And I also have a, a limited time today because I got to do some homework help, <laughs> if that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I have a couple, I have about three or four questions, if you don't mind. I'm just going to go through each one just to be courteous to everybody's time. And then you could, you know, at least we get it in for the record. And you could feel free to uh, answer those or not right now at, at your leisure. How's that? Okay, perfect. All right. Are there currently any full or part-time uh, social service workers, social workers uh, within the town of Mount Pleasant uh, or Mount Pleasant Police Department uh, and, and specifically not the Mount Pleasant School District? That's question one. Okay. Question, question two is, is there any on-call social service workers or social workers within uh, other adjacent uh, jurisdictions? That's question two. Question three, has the Mount Pleasant Police Department ever uh, engaged social services worker or social services uh, uh, facilities uh, after an arrest has been made? And then lastly, um, if additional social services or social worker type services were offered to the Mount Pleasant uh, Police Department, 
from, let's say, federal, uh, state, or uh, county uh, agencies or, or, or uh, uh, you know, or, uh, individuals from those agencies, even on a, a part-time basis, do you think that the uh, Mount Pleasant Police Department would avail of that? Those are the four questions I want to make sure I got it. Thank sure. you. Uh, well, I can, I can take this request. I address those now while they're hot or fresh, or uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can um, I can address those now. Sure. Uh, working backwards, your last question, I'm going to say yes. Good. Uh, if if there were uh, resources available, uh, social service uh, that you know something was created uh, additionally to assist us uh, out in the field. I would welcome that, um, so there, I would have no problem doing that. Uh, as far as um, do we engage uh, social services now? Yes. Uh, one of the type of calls that we'll, we'll go on is um, welfare checks. So sometimes uh, people will have elderly parents that live in, in our area uh, in Mount Pleasant but they may live in California or somewhere across the country and um, the parents get uh, on an age and um, there's concerns. And usually the police are the ones that get called for problems. So um, there is an adult protective service, which is uh, out of the Westchester County. Um, so if we believe, or if a, a police officer believes that um, they can't rectify a situation uh, and family is not available, uh, we reach out to um, adult protective services. Uh, by the same token, if um, we're uh, mandated, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if we're, I believe we are mandated reporters. There are certain people that are mandated reporters as far as uh, child abuse. Um, if we responded to an aided call and, uh, and believe that there were circumstances that might be suspicious and that and that uh, a fall or an, ac an accident may not be an accident, um, then we would uh, engage Child Protective Services from the county. Um, if we had to, we could make an emergency removal of a child or anybody that we thought was in danger. Uh, so that's a yes. Um, are there on-call uh, social services in other jurisdictions that are employed by the different municipalities, uh, to my knowledge, no. Um, and and does Mount Pleasant have uh, social service uh, workers or tr social service trained uh, persons um, that uh, are employed by the town at this point? No. Uh, they, there's. Um, Obviously, trying to staff something like like that, you would need multiple uh, you need multiple employees. That, um, but it, but currently, we don't have anything like that. Well, when you're dealing with like Pleasant Hill Cottage School, well, well, when we respond to some of the facilities like Pleasant Hill Cottage School, Buckland Cedar Knolls, and and the schools, there are there are actually are social workers on staff in and these facilities that we work with, but. Uh, but there are not, there's no employees of the town that are, uh, you know, other than the experience that the officers have in, in dealing with um, in dealing with people, uh, there are no uh, persons that, that uh, you know, are classified as social workers employed by the town of or, or any other municipality, as far as I know. Uh, in my experience with the Chiefs Association, I, I don't know if that's excellent. That was actually much much more thorough than I expected. Thank thank you, Chief. That's that's, that's excellent. Uh, just getting back to uh, I don't uh, uh, Dr. David, uh, I, if you had any comment on what what functions you thought the police should perform and how the police and the community should engage with one another. Uh, yeah, certainly um, protective uh, services protect the population. Uh, I think, uh, you know, after the fact, I mean, when they're called, 
uh, protective role there, but I'm wondering about preventive, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, preventive uh, role, uh, preventing, is it possible to prevent crime? Um, I think that's where the, the social services are, are an essential uh, element. <clears throat> um, I think that, that uh, the, one of the functions the police should perform as a agency of the uh, of the public of the government is uh, to reflect the uh, the uh, demographics, reflect the the population, so that it in some sense represents um, a community police. And we talked about that last week, but uh, I think that's one of its functions. Or okay. should be Thank one of its functions. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, Mr. Kunzio, what's your feeling on that? Hi, Chief. How are you? Um, yeah, I, I mean, to add on, I think, to what people said, and I think you, you guys do some you know, sort of some of preventative things, uh, different safety, safety initiatives uh, with the community, the, uh, I know the car seat things and, you know, prior to pandemic, you know, a lot of different safety things where the officers would come to the schools and, and support different, uh, you know, functions, um, whether being visible at sporting events and so forth. So, you know, obviously the traditional roles and, and certainly some of those proactive things are you know, always welcome um, in the school community. Uh, Dr. Lori Smith, um, just what, what function do you think the police should perform and how should the police and community engage one, one another? Oh, we're gonna unmute you. Hold on one second. There we go. Hang on one second, Dr. Spino, we're going to get you unmuted. Am I, am I there? Yep, you're here. Okay, okay great. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think the first question was, what is the role of the police officer? What, what do I feel the role of the police officer is? Um, I think it would be to maintain public order um, to, to provide safety and security and, um, enforce the law. Um, but, uh, the gentleman before me spoke about community policing. I think, I think I would like to see maybe more of that. And maybe that is occurring and you can speak about that, but I see community policing is just basically developing partnerships. And we spoke a little bit about, just a little bit about that last week where um, that would that would invoke trust and transparency and maybe um, promote a better work working relationship with the community. So um, prevention, I'm all about prevention and public health. Uh, so that's, um, that's what, that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Kelsey uh, Pat. Hello. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, thanks for calling me. Uh, I, you know, it's a big, huge question that we're going to be working on answering. What, what, you know, the Mount Pleasant Police uh, should be doing, and are doing, and what changes we want to make. Um, I, at its base level. You want some agency of the government to protect you, um, to protect your life and to protect uh, your property, right? Um, unfortunately, due to uh, the Castle Rock Doctrine, um, as, as uh, interpreted by the Supreme Court, um, police do not actually have the obligation to protect your life or your property. Um, they 
Uh, and you guys can look into that if you'd like. There's a really good episode of a podcast called Radio Lab about it. Um, anyway, all of that is to say this idea that we have of the police being these protectors, I don't know that that plays out so much on the ground oftentimes. And of course, there are tons of times that the, the cops do a great job. But for certain communities, they don't see cops as the answer. They don't call cops when they have an emergency. And that's wrong. If we are providing public safety, it needs to be for every member of the community. And some people, just because of the color of their skin, um, because of, you know, uh, all different things. Like if you are a trans woman, you're far less likely to call the police and you are far more likely to receive violence. So what's the story there? We need a police that, you know, protect every citizen. And, you know, of course, I, I know that's the intention of the police department, but we need it. You almost need to do a, like a reframing of what you are at all to different parts of the population so that they'll, they'll be comfortable calling the police when they do have an emergency. And unfortunately, um, I know last week we had a uh, um, Margarita here, but today I'm not entirely certain if we have anybody representing uh, the black community on this uh, uh, on this committee call. Um, and I think that's really important because those are the people you need to be talking to, um, minorities uh, and other people who uh, are having, have more issues with the police, you know? I, as a white lady, I can't tell you all the answers here, <laughs> but I do know what I've been hearing from from the people who, who feel affected by this. They don't feel safe calling the cops, and that's something that the cops need to change. Um, and so what that looks like, I don't know, but I do believe there should be a uh, social service you can call if someone's having a mental breakdown. You know, you call 911 for cops because there's a robbery, but you call 511 as a guy on the corner is uh, screaming, you know, uh, and then figuring out the difference between those th two things. And then when we do have those two working in tandem, maybe it's something dispatchers figure out. I don't know, but um, things have got to change. I could go on forever, so I'm going to stop now. I just, I, I, uh, I was remiss. I wanted to ask Margarita, when, and I'm hoping she's able to come back on if not tonight, then at, at some other point. Um, if she had a particular problem with, with uh, Mount Pleasant police or, or if it was just a general statement that, that she felt that she had to educate her her son on, you know, how to behave. And, and uh, I mean, I, if, if we, if we probably, I, I don't know if it's a marketing problem where, where we need, because I, I, I do have very, really good officers here and we have minimal uh, complaints. So it might be more getting the, getting the uh, not the word out, but I want that trans woman to feel comfortable calling the police just like any, just like anybody else. So I, I either someone might have had a bad experience in the past. I don't want that to carry over to our department. Unfortunately, I think that's what's happened across the country. And I'm not saying there's not bad police officers out there because um, there are. Um, but it's, it's unfortunate that, that everyone gets painted with the, with the same brush and uh, broad brush. And um, so maybe we need to do a better job, at, 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 like Dr. Smith said, at, as to getting out to the community. And, um, you know, and that, that was one of the reasons why we thought it was important to have a, a presence in the schools so that so that people the kids felt comfortable um you know in realizing that cops are human beings and they're not out to just arrest them and, and do them. so so that's a, a point well taken so thank you can i add to that just to say that like i totally understand the feeling of like we're getting painted with a different brush because these people over here are doing this bad thing um, I understand that feeling, but I don't think that that's the case. I think it's systemically the uh, how we have created police departments is creating this dynamic. Um, like a lot of ways that the job is done, the training, all that kind of stuff is 
is made in certain ways that that do make you know that person in the community not feel safe calling the police so there needs to be structural changes to change that and i also don't think that we should say this is some far off problem you know, we had a shooting of a young unarmed black man in this community 10 years ago. And in that case, you know, people still want that reopened. I would love to have an AG investigation of that case. Um, I know other people have said, don't bring it up. It was 10 years ago. But things like this happen everywhere. And, and we are not immune to this issue. Just because it hasn't happened again in 10 years doesn't mean that there couldn't be a possible another situation like this. And it doesn't mean that people, you know, aren't um, feeling uncomfortable by or feeling like they are not being protected by the public safety system provided by their local government. Thank you. Okay. I didn't want to, uh, I mean, we could get into that if we wanted to, but I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there was a, I know the Department of Justice did look into that incident um and and they felt that there was uh nothing there for civil rights violations um and that a grand jury was convened on that and uh and there were no charges against the uh, officer uh levy so uh i don't want to relitigate that now i don't want to get caught in the weeds but maybe if we do have time later uh at some point uh it's something that, that we can address um so I'm not, I'm not afraid of it. It's just, I don't, to get into it properly, it might take a lot of time. And then I don't know what I'm, well, it's closed now. I'm probably at liberty, uh, you know, to discuss it uh, to some level, but, but uh, look, that's maybe somewhere where we can go at some point. So, all right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Connie Santini. You're on. Chief, oh, I did not see. I did not see her on. Okay. Uh, Mr. Swosey. Good, good evening, Chief. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, I'm operating at a loss, I think, because I've only lived in Mount Pleasant for 50 years. I've never been to Portland. I've never been to Seattle. <laughs> and the only thing I know about Minneapolis until recently was Mary Tyler Moore and Lou Grant had a show there. Since I've been put on the committee though, listening and watching, my understanding that this is a police reform committee for the town of Mount Pleasant and not other jurisdictions that may or may not have severe problems. Well, one question I have, Chief, in the, in the perfect world, I think whatever job you have, you'd like to have all the tools in the toolbox, but tools are very expensive. So one question I have, other than the cottage school and Cedar Knowles, in the course of business on a monthly basis, how often would you have need or a social worker to accompany a police officer, say to a domestic call at three o'clock in the morning. And if you had that tool in your toolbox, logistically, how would that work at three in the morning? Uh, well, would be there, you know, you'd hate to look at the financial cost of that, but um, there's a couple of things in play. There's a safety issue. Uh, a lot of times calls of, of an emotionally disturbed person or domestic incidents, um, they can be very volatile and can get violent rather quickly. Uh, and there are a lot of times when an initial call for service, uh, whether it be a 911 call, might start out as a noise complaint, um, but it could very well be a violent confrontation going on. So uh, if you, if you had, uh, you know, the police respond immediately because we're out on the road, uh, you know, 24 seven, uh, and we, you know, take pride in being able to respond rapidly to anything. Um, so to have a, a social worker on board, uh, you, you'd have to have someone working 24, 24 seven, um, as an employee, I think it's probably the best way to go. 
Um, and then that person would have to be prepared, uh, you know, to encounter violence. Hopefully the police could protect uh, that person and allow them to do their job. Um, uh, and that may be where it's going at certain places. I think they started it um, in some areas across the country and we'll see how, how it shakes out. Um, there, some of the facilities we go to, uh, Pleasantville Cottage School and Cedar Knolls and uh, a couple of the residential, other uh, small residential uh, homes that we go to that uh, I should call them, I don't know what the prop there I guess it's residential settings uh, for persons. And we have several in town. Um, there are already social workers and trained people there. And uh, they're, when, when they're in trouble, they're calling for us to come and help. And uh, so that's what, uh, I don't know if adding a social worker to our complement of employees would really uh, do anything different because basically when the social workers are calling, it's because someone's out of control and, and they need assistance. Uh, and sometimes it's the skills of the officer and just trying to talk somebody down. Um, sometimes it's the, the, uh, uh, the, just the presence of a police officer there. Uh, although lately in some of these, you know, my experience has been that, that sometimes that exacerbates it when the police are, are, are there for some people. But in general, they're calling us uh, and they are trained um, and in social work and uh, counseling, and they're calling us because they're in trouble and they can't control somebody and, and they need assistance. So that's, I'm not sure how just adding a social worker to, to our, um, our force would, would work. There are some cases where uh, we do try to get uh, services for, for someone that's in crisis. Um, and I mentioned in the last meeting that uh, through sort of like telehealth services, the county was offering something uh, where if someone wasn't in, in, in danger of violence or hurting themselves and we didn't have to bring them directly to the hospital, it would be nice if there was a mechanism for them to get some sort of services and we could put them in direct contact with, uh, with social services or a, a counselor, someone that could help them. So I'm totally on board with that. And then that would take away the, uh, the potential danger of having a social worker out in the field. As it is now, if Child Protective has to make a visit to uh, remove a child uh, and their county employees, they will call us and come to the police department or meet us at a residence in case things go bad. So we do have some sort of a uh, relationship already with the, with the county. Um, I, and uh, I do know that one of the things we're exploring as a chief association and, and uh, um, the county executive may be working towards more, a, a group of uh, more highly trained police officers that specialize in, in counseling and social service that may be able to bridge that gap. Uh, so we're in discussions uh, or I know they're talking about it now. Um, so I have, I have limited knowledge of it, but I know that it's out there and they're, they're discussing it on a, on a countywide level. That might make a little bit more sense to do it on a countywide level than to have each individual municipality, you know, hire a, a social worker. So, um, so that's kind of, it, it's not out of the picture. I do like the, the remotes, the idea of maybe having remote services, but uh, but we'll, we'll we'll see where it goes from there. I'm, I'm, you know, we're not opposed to that at all. Like we, so the police would like to help. You know, we we uh, but I do I will say that that you know that uh, when our personnel does go to uh, different facilities, um, they they really try to calm things down and uh, and assist and uh, you know not lock people up and take them away. That they're at these facilities because they have, um, there's issues and, and hardship in their lives and, and we're sympathetic to that. And, uh, and I think though our people are really, are trying to do the best they can to help out. Um, and uh, 
you know, and not just, you know, arrest people that are out of control. We realize that it's uh, mental health related and we're trying to get them the services that they need. Um, uh, Chief, uh, I hope I didn't give the impression that I was advocating to have a social worker on call. I was just trying to get at uh, the uh, reality of the situation is in the course of a month, uh, from what I've read and been told that in uh, of all the calls that the police get, a domestic call in the middle of the night uh, could be very dangerous, if not the most dangerous call they make. I'm not sure that's true here in Mount Pleasant. You would know that better than I. But how often do you get a call at three in the morning where you, where you might wish you had a social worker on board? Uh, and as you pointed out, it could get violent very quickly and how would that person be protected? But really, the, what I'm getting at is how often you think you might need a social worker if you had that ability to have one instantaneously. The real world situation. Well, real world, um, if you get a domestic dispute at, at three in the morning, um, usually at that point, uh, it's pretty heated. And, um, right. and it would be nice to say that uh, a social worker might be able to uh, calm things down, but there, there's potential that you, an officer, might have to get physical to calm somebody down. Um, so generally, right when something happens, uh, to inject a social worker in the middle of a heated argument between them, a, a couple or or uh, you know father son or um, that might not be the best. Uh, opportunity time-wise because tempers are uh, flaring. Uh, so in my experience, that might not be the best time. I'm not saying that that the, that, that uh, problem might not have uh, a solution for another symptom that may have caused this blow up to start with. And that may be where a social worker um, may have a better uh, angle at uh, trying to keep us from having to respond back there multiple times. So, so I do, I like the idea of it, but to your point at three o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, when you're trying to separate people and calm the situation down immediately, I don't, I don't know uh, what the efficacy of the social worker might be at that point. I don't, I, you know, I'm not a social worker, although uh, maybe at some point in my career, you know, we, I like to think that we, you know, police officers are, are supposed to calm things down, try to get a person the services that they need. At a domestic, it might be sending one of the parties to family court if they believe there's, uh, you know, past acts that may require an order of protection. Or, so we do try to uh, assess. Or they're always making assessments um, and, uh, and de-escalating, correct? Uh, you know, a situation and, and then um, and trying to get the appropriate services for somebody. And, uh, and we take those, you know, we take those very seriously uh, as all calls, but they, domestic violence calls have, uh, have much more of a potential um, for violence uh, or, or domestic calls, I should say, have a lot more potential for violence for everybody involved there. Um, and and officers responding. So, so, but that's kind of my take on on uh, social services deploying right right to the scene. Uh, but I believe they are trying that in other in other places. And um, and you know we'll we'll take counsel from the committee on that and see whatever what everyone thinks. So, uh, uh, yes. If I could just say something on, on that, I agreed with a lot of the discussion or some of the discussion about uh, things are potentially problematic everywhere, not just uh, in one particular place or the other. But I want to, on the issue of what the police should or shouldn't do, the, the, I, I think we, we should all agree, I think, that just like in the medical profession, whatever comes of this, we certainly should not do any harm. We certainly should not make any recommendations that uh, that 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 make things worse. Certainly, right? Uh, whether it's in enforcement or whatever. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because I have a specific example, uh, just from my own background in um, 
in Egypt back in 2011 or so. Everybody, I'm sure, heard about the Arab Spring and all of that stuff. During that period of time, after things um, were pretty, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say violent, but when there, there was a lot of upheaval, the police and law enforcement basically uh, took a hiatus. They, 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 they were nowhere to be found. And so people within various street blocks created their own, you know, impromptu law enforcement just to protect their, 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 their family and their property. And it went on for several weeks and they would sit, take shifts watching and making sure. And, and it, was, it was a nightmare. It was a mess and my own family members um, uh, recounted it for me. So that, it, it, we are very blessed to have the kinds of uh, law enforcement that we do, of course. And so the last thing that I think we should do is, 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 is make things worse because the role of the police, you know, conducted in a, in a professional manner is uh is is just you know it's critical it's not just important so i'll sign off <laughs> thanks thank you, thank you. Uh, uh tom milia we're gonna get you unmuted tom Mr. Millian, we uh, sent you an unmute request. If you could just accept that and turn on your video. Uh, oh, there he is. There he is. Oh, it's just muted. So, oh, there you go. I think you're. Uh, well, I can. If you don't have video, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear. Yep. Okay. All right, my name is Tom Milliot. Sorry, I missed last week. I am with McCarthy Insurance in Hawthorne, and I'm also the president of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, while we're on this subject, I'd like to say that I had the, um, the experience of witnessing a rather disturbed young female about five years ago. Uh, it was assumed that she was coming from the Cedar Knowles School and I was quite impressed, and this again goes years back, how uh, professional the Mount Pleasant Police Department was and witnessed how difficult of a situation it was uh, with all the rules and regulations in place. And uh, it's uh, unfortunate that uh, you know, these situations do seem to occur more and more now. Um, I do have a question uh, for Chief, if you uh, can answer is I am curious uh, how much training the current Mount Pleasant police force is getting in the social services realm of dealing with uh, people that are a bit unstable or are on uh, drugs or alcohol or something. Is that something that's high on the training list these days? Uh, so officers that come out of the academy get crisis intervention training um, and that's targeted towards uh, persons of, that are, are having a mental health crisis. Um, we're in the process of, of trying to get the, the rest of the officers uh, schooled in that. Um, it's a 40-hour it's a course, so you're going to lose uh, an officer for about a week. Um, that's one of the benefits of having a, a little bit of additional manpower for, for, uh, so that you can send uh, officers to training uh, so we do um, so there there is uh, some roll call training that we do um, we've done some training for instance on um, on dealing with uh, people that have autism uh, you know they may not listen to you to your commands um, so there have been videos and things that we've done uh, and an officer can uh, request to go to different trainings if they have a, uh, a particular area that they wanted to get additional training. In. So we have it. Um, the, but I think the biggest part is uh, really the on on the job part. Um, we an officer is supposed to should have patience, and I think uh, our officers have a, a lot of patience. Um, 
I was, uh, we had the opportunity to promote two officers today to the rank of sergeant, and I was looking in their personnel files uh, yesterday. And um, in 2018, we had an incident where a young lady at uh, a resident in Plesmo Cottage School was suicidal and um, was gonna throw herself off the roof. And there were three officers there, uh, one of them being uh, the detective that got promoted. And they actually climbed up onto the roof and grabbed her um, and prevented her from jumping. She went to throw herself off and they put themselves in danger. Uh, I think they're sympathetic uh, to people um, and, and in people in crisis. And, uh, and I think that's probably the most important part, having patience and then the knowledge to know. Uh, I, I mentioned last week, we had a, a, an encounter with a homeless gentleman and it's not against the law to be homeless. So um, he didn't want services. He was speaking to the devil, which was next to him. And uh, he did not want to go to the hospital and he wasn't committing a crime. Uh, we just don't grab people and uh, relieve them of their freedom for no reason. I would have hoped that he would have wanted to go to the hospital, but we can't, you know, we're, we're not allowed to force somebody to go to the hospital unless they're a danger to themselves or others. And we're cop officers or, you know, I try to hire real smart people. They have to make an assessment in a short amount of time and uh, we ended up escorting that gentleman, you know, just making sure he made it to the train station. Um, but he didn't commit any crime. And like I said, being uh, homeless is not a, uh, it's not a crime. And we, we, there was no reason to arrest him, but we did try to get him help. So it's, it's everyday encounters that the police officers are having that uh, give them a wealth of experience in, in how to deal with people. And uh, um, one of the things we did focus on uh, after this Minneapolis George Floyd incident was um, was the the idea of tapping out uh, an officer. So um, anytime there's an encounter with a police officer and it gets physical, there's always a gun involved in the fight, and that's the officer's gun. And uh, I've been lucky in my career; I never had a, a to fight for my own gun, um, but I can, I've been in encounters and uh, you can get very excited and angry. And, uh, and I think um, one of the things we focus on training all officers was that if you're a secondary officer that's there and you realize that an officer just was in the fight of their life, um, once it's under control, you know, tap that other officer out, and get them out of there so that, uh, so that he, he or she can, can calm down. Something that we never thought of before. Um, maybe we did think of it before, but we didn't formalize that. So uh, it goes to police work being dynamic and how, how we try to use examples of, uh, um, from other, other agencies, some of their mistakes, some of their successes. Uh, in White Plains a few years ago, they had a, a death of a, a mostly disturbed gentleman. I think he was a veteran, Ken Chamberlain. Um, and he was in his own apartment and uh, yelling and screaming, neighbors called. And uh, the police were trying to get in to assist him. And uh, when they forced their way in, he had a, a hatchet, a taser didn't work, uh, that the officers deployed and, and they ended up using deadly force and they shot and killed him. And it made uh, everyone rethink um, how you handle those calls. If someone's in a home uh, by themselves and no one else is in danger, we, we back off now. Uh, it, years ago, maybe we would have never done that, but it goes to how we try to be aware of, of, uh, of changes, changes in society. If we weren't doing something right, then we'll change. So um, it, again, it's not against the law to be uh, to have, you know, mental illness. And, um, if you're not in danger, you know, if you're not a danger to yourself or anyone else, or now really, even if you're a danger to yourself, uh, we don't, we won't respond if no one else is in, we'll, we'll respond, but we will not force our way in. If, um, we will try to get you some sort of ancillary services, but, 
uh, but we're not going to we're not going to force our way in and and create a situation where we might have to hurt you. So uh, so these are all things that in the last uh, in my tenure as chief, it's it's uh, six years um, that we've changed. We've changed course on and, and uh, adapted how we respond uh, to persons in in crisis. So. Um, now, Paul, do you see the day coming to this other gentleman's point about having, you know, people specialist on staff on your on your crew there? Would there be a day when a certain amount of officers are trained as specialists in social work and in psychology to be the specialist to deal with the difficult situations? Um, I, I would see more and I, I would be open to sending uh, police officers to that additional training to get them to that additional level um, and and not uh, I, there are some bad people out there and there are people that are um, that may be intent on hurting uh, anybody uh, a police officer included um, and there are people that are are in crisis and um, and and that they they may hurt somebody. So I just I don't know if a social worker uh, is willing to sign on to the fact. But so I'll give you an example. On Thanksgiving Day, we I had the police radio on, and we responded to um, Hawthorne Cedar Knowles. One of the counselors there, uh, her finger was uh, amputated. Um, it got caught. It, it was in a doorway and two of the residents there intentionally um, slammed the door and would not get off and she was screaming for mercy and her finger ended up getting amputated. And, um, I, you know, she's a, a social worker counselor there and, um, and she lost her finger. Uh, and um, I don't know if, if they're prepared for if the social worker would be prepared to defend themselves uh, at that level. And uh, that's what scares me. So I, I would much more prefer to see police officers more highly trained so that, so that they uh, had additional tools on how to deal with, with persons that were in crisis. So definitely agree. Yeah. I have a comment. Um, you're talking about, you said, you said two very interesting things. Um, you spoke about, you try to hire smart people and, uh, you know, you just referred to the highly trained, more highly trained officer. And I just thought, wouldn't it be, certainly want to bounce this off the committee, would it, or would it not be helpful to maybe, um, highlight the officers. I mean, we're talking about a group of people that I don't, I don't really know who they are, um, other than if I called 911. Um, could there be some type of a forum where maybe on the website of the Mount Pleasant Police and we have a picture and it's, you know, police officer of the month or something like this, and we just talk about their experience and, and their education. I think education is important, but certainly it doesn't mean anything without experience. Um, and, and I just thought maybe one phrase that kind of could personalize this officer, maybe they're a mother, maybe they are a son, something very nebulous um, to respect the privacy of the police officer, but just something to, to, to personalize them and, and talk about who they are, because we need to know, we're talking about them as in this group, um, this abstract group of men and women. And when in reality, we as this serve, um, we don't, I, I, I don't know all of them and I would like to know all of them and, and maybe that might be helpful. And then in doing so, um, we can also talk about what type of cultural sensitivity, cultural uh, training they receive on the job. And maybe you can talk about how that has morphed over the years. Um, Ms. Paget brought up that unfortunate event 10 years ago. Well, what, what, was there any training that occurred as a result of that unarmed black man who was 
shot by the police? Was there something that was done? Yes, there. everyone was found to be not guilty or whatever it is, but what was done? On a, on a more personal level. And I think if we can kind of make the police ha have an aspect of, of the police being personal, maybe it would be more relatable. And in that way, maybe it could promote a more trust, a trusting relationship with the community. So I guess I'm throwing it out to the committee to see if anyone thinks it might be a good idea to have a officer of the month and put up their picture and how long they've been on the job and you know uh, what their education and experience is. And I don't even know if this is something that's allowable for police to do, but um, I just like to throw that out for discussion. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say that that's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, as much as I would like to uh, recognize individual officers for your accomplishments, which I think we do with, um, you know, when they go above and beyond, uh, you know, if, if they get an award or, or um, uh, but at the same time, we're living in a different world um, with social media and um, they, they had uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, after they had their incidents there, the, the Mike Brown incident, um, there were people that were, uh, they call it doxing. It's when you take someone's personal information and you uh, post it all over the internet. And uh, so we, we recommend that um, police officers have a, a, a low social media profile uh, and don't say, hey, this is where my kids go to school. And because there have been incidents recently where people have gone to the school of police officers, uh, you know, where their children go to school. Uh, in Carmel, they had an incident where they were protesting outside of the, the chief of police's house um, regarding an incident that happened up there. And I, I listen, Nick, it can come with the territory if you're the chief. I get that. Um, but, uh, uh, at some level, you know, some officers don't want the attention on their families because there, there could be repercussions. I did say not, you know, there are, I think way more good people than there are, uh, people that have bad intentions, but, but if someone puts you in the crosshairs as a police officer and they say they're going to hurt you or your family. It's uh, it's pretty unnerving, and uh, I've had it happen, you know, before. And it's something that that it, it's a little we're a little um, reluctant. As much as I'd like to give them personal credit and put an officer's name in the newspaper when they do something really good, there's there's that side of it. I'm, I'm not afraid of the transparency part of it, uh, except I am afraid of the officer safety and the safety of their families. I need them to to feel secure enough that that they can do their job without having to worry about you know uh, family members so so I maybe there's some something out of that that we can that we can take where maybe we can showcase training that they have without really personally identifying them but to your point uh, Dr. Schmidt the you know you, you, your police officers are human no no police officer goes to work and says Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot somebody today, or I'm gonna. That's the last thing one they would like to do because it it ruins your life, and uh, it's so they're they're not that. That's the last thing you want to do, and and uh, any officer wants to do, um, you know, put you under the microscope. There's civil action against you. There's potential criminal action against you. Um, it's not something that that somebody wants to do. Uh, and um, so, but and things can turn. I'm, you know, in, in uh, these different areas of the country, uh, you know, I'd never heard of Ferguson, Missouri before, but boy, you heard about it after after this one incident. And if some of the stuff you hear may not even be factual, but if it gets out there on social media, it gets traction, and uh, and then sometimes people believe it, and. Uh, so it's it's uh, a little bit of a double-edged sword there. So maybe we can take some part of that, um, and at least showcase what what type of training we have. That may be part of uh, 
um, of something that we can we can do, but I'm a little re reluctant to uh, like personally identify um, officers just because of this climate that we have now. So, Chief, on, on, on that point, I don't think any officer gets up in the morning and says, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see like a rest day. That's not, that's not their job. That's not their, what they look forward to doing. I, I know our officers, I know they're good people, and that's not the way they live their life. But they wanted to see how many people they could arrest. Number one thing is that they're protecting the public. That's what they're there for. And that's what they uh, have shown me that they want to do. Uh, the training, I think, is a very important thing. Just, you can never have too much training. And I think that's a great idea that we get a little more training on the psychological aspect of, of being a police officer. But I don't think you could ever have too much training. So I, I would agree with. Any, any training that we could get, I'm all for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I could just all circle back. Um, if uh, I don't know if Claire is on. Um, and I, I think I saw Margarita on uh, before. Margarita, are you there still? Yes, Chief, just give me one second. Sure. I'm here, Chief. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining us again. Um, good. Sorry, I was a little bit uh, late. I had the wrong link, apparently. No problem. <laughs> Is it a, could, I, I'm not sure. Could someone add me to the invite list? Because I'm, I have to get it from uh, Richard. If uh, Margarita, if you could email me at, uh, or you could either e email the police reform at mtpleasantny.com and then we can pull your email from that, or you want to send it to me, P. Oliva at mtpleasantny.com. And we'll, okay, we'll get it done. We'll do. Okay. Um, so we were just, we hit this first question. Um, and uh, uh, well, first of all, let me just go back. And you had some comments last week, and I just wanted to. I, and you had said that that you spoke to your son um, about uh, you know you had to talk with them about what, dealing with the police and stuff. Was there anything uh, specific to Mount Pleasant that you had an issue with, or was it just sort of in general um, in dealing with the police? Or I just I meant to ask you that. No, nothing specific in uh, Mount Pleasant. That's just a general. Um, oh safety measure that we as uh, black people have to um, you know, think about on a daily basis. So nothing specific in Mount Pleasant, um, but my son is, uh, you know, he's 23 in college and he works so he does a lot of driving and often I'm very nervous for his safety. Is he living with you on, on campus still or? Mm -hmm. He goes back and forth. So he's he's uh attends college in New Rochelle and he drives back and forth. All right. So the police test is gonna be next year in the springtime. <laughs> I'm gonna send you uh information if he's interested. So Thank um, you. I appreciate that. So my the, aunt is actually a police officer in Yonkers for well over 30 years, and it's it's very interesting because um we often talk about, you know, the racial disparities. And, um, you know, she just recently retired about four years ago. And, you know, she said the most disturbing part to her about, you know, being, you know, a black woman on the police force, imagine 30, 40 years ago, being a black woman on the police force in Yonkers, New York, is that, you know, there, although there has been some change, but there was a lot more that needed to be done in terms of diversifying police force. Uh, I'm hoping that they, in the last couple of years, that uh, that they, you know, done a lot. It just, uh, I know Commissioner Mueller has been in there for a, a year or two, and I know that um, that he's pretty progressive down there. So I'm hoping yeah. that they're heading in the right direction. So. Mm -hmm. Um, to, as far as, uh, um, your insight on, uh, on what you think the, what functions the police should perform, I just based on, you know, on your personal feelings and, and, um, 
and maybe your professional role up there at, at uh, Pleasantville College? Um, I, you know, for me as a, as a, a black woman, this certainly goes very deep. Um, it's not just about police. Um, I think the systemic, uh, racism that continues to perpetuate these type of, you know, racist policies and things that we have to deal with on, on a daily basis. I mean, it goes so deep. I don't know even know where to start sometimes, Chief. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I do know that, um, it, it is not for, it is not our black people's responsibility to educate other cultures and, and white people on how they need to educate themselves on how to interact with black people. That is the role that white people need to take on. Um, it's it's kind of like you're asking the victim to teach you how to not to victimize. And um, I do know that as a social worker, because I am a licensed clinical social worker, so I do have a lot of training in um, managing mental health issues um, and crises. Um, I'm just listening to some of your ideas about training and you talked about um, tapping out. There's just, you know, some words that come up for me. Um, and in our field, we do what we call therapeutic crisis intervention training. Um, and that's exactly what we train each other to do is to tap out and um, to identify when our colleague is in what we call a conflict cycle with one of our clients. Um, when we're not getting anywhere, when we see our client or when we see our colleague being frustrated because we're all human, um, we actually do tap them out. So um, I would probably start with training um, to probably look into what types of trainings there are for therapeutic crisis intervention training um, to take on a more therapeutic role. I do know as police officers, when you arrive to a scene, just, just as we are, um, our first role is to bring safety to the situation. We, we wanna make sure that everyone is safe first and foremost, and then we follow up. I do think that you know, having a mental health professional on the police force would absolutely be valuable because they're able to circle back around even after the incident has occurred to that family or that individual and to provide additional services that they may need to help prevent um, from happening again. I think surveying may be really good. You know, I just went to the, to, I had a trip to the ER and they actually called me and said, how did we do? What can we do to change? was how was our service? I, I think surveying may be something else that you may wanna look into um, because it's very helpful to get feedback um, from the person who has experienced um, the situation. But one of the things that we took from uh, City of White Plains has been doing it for a while on uh, domestic calls. Um, they will follow up a couple of days later. It was something that we, you know, just to make sure that the victim is doing okay. Um, if, the, if there's additional issues, they'll knock on the door uh, just to make sure that if an offender was arrested, um, that they're not back on the premises, if there was an order of protection. Um, but generally just to check on the, uh, on the caller or the victim in domestic violence. So uh, it's something that we took on uh, and that we try to follow up on, on domestic violence calls. Some people don't want to talk to you, um, and, and that's fine. Um, but, but possibly doing follow up and surveying on, uh, on other calls is, uh, I like that idea. It's, um, cause then you can get feedback. Cause just to send a, a, a general survey out to everybody in the community, um, you know, some people may have not have had an interaction with the police, but this is more targeted. It's actually people that, that you have dealt with, and then you're getting an opinion from them on, on how we did. So, and, and it's a little more, uh, you know, not what happened to you 10 years ago, or, you know, you got stopped and the officer was rude. That doesn't help me. Maybe that guy's retired, but, uh, but, you know, something more relevant and, and, uh, that we could definitely use and, and act on. So I, I like that idea. Thank you. Yeah. Um, All right. 
I'm going to move on because we're already an hour into this here, believe it or not. Um, so uh, part of what, uh, I guess we sort of covered some of the issues in, in here, but determining the role of the police. Um, so we sort of covered what, what role the police currently play in, in your community. Uh, I can give you an idea of what uh, some of the calls that we go on. Um, you know, we, uh, we do animal complaints, noise complaints, aided cases, uh, lift assist calls if uh, someone's elderly and falls and, um, and they're not injured, or maybe we don't know if they're injured or not yet, but sometimes we'll just lift them back up. They don't want to go to the hospital. Uh, so we do those, uh, we'll do a welfare check if someone hasn't, you know, seen somebody or they're concerned about. Uh, their welfare, we'll, we'll stop by and talk to them. We investigate motor vehicle accidents. Um, we, we check uh, all of the public schools. Um, we'll do facility checks uh, just to make sure that no one's doing damage. You're technically not supposed to be on school grounds um, when school's not in session. Um, we'll do vehicle and traffic enforcement. Uh, we have one officer that does... Uh, um, that's assigned to uh, uh, traffic. Uh, we'll investigate unattended deaths. Um, uh, we do, some people will call building complaints in, um, you know, construction on a weekend, uh, on a Sunday, commercial construction. We'll, we'll uh, handle that because then the regular building department isn't in. Uh, someone has a, a Water main issue, the water leak, and we'll notify the water department. We'll check it out, notify the water department. We'll do death notifications um, if someone has died in an accident or incident, um, and we have to let the family know. Um, we'll do emergency storm management. Uh, if there's a big storm going on and trees are down, we, we have an emergency operations center. Um, or people, this last uh, big storm we had, we have people trapped on some of their streets and we try to make sure they had the proper resources and could get in and out of their homes. We track sex offenders, um, you know, if they, if they have to register. So that's up to the local police department to, to keep a check on them. We do, we'll do uh, alcoholic beverage, beverage control enforcement. If there's a, a place that has a uh, liquor license, we will, um, uh, do an inspection, make sure uh, everyone's of age, and uh, and that the license is in uh, is in fact um, valid and in effect. Uh, crime prevention will do, uh, you know, just by driving around or uh, targeting crime prevention programs. Um, that's just uh, lost adults. That's become the thing. Sometimes you'll have someone who's uh, the stages of dementia. And they um, we'll jump in the car and uh, uh, probably about a month ago, a, a gentleman went to go pick up pizza. He was in his 80s and uh, he was causing a traffic problem. I was on my way home from work. Um, I, I turned around um, and he was confused and, uh, and we got him home. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, I drove his car for him and a police officer followed me and then we tried to get in. I spoke to his family and, and said that they probably shouldn't allow him to drive anymore. Uh, so we do a lot of different uh, community things. Uh, that's kind of what we're up to. I probably only covered about half of them, but uh, but those are some of the types of things that we uh, that we do. Um, so we did cover uh, through some of the questions that um, that Hussein uh, mentioned. Should we about deploying social service personnel in addition or instead of police officers? So we did get some comment on that. Um, can your community reduce violence more effectively by redeploying resources from policing to other programs? Um, so I don't know, maybe uh, if someone has any uh, comment on that. So it's, can you reduce violence I, I, I don't think we have a particular violence problem, but um, but could we reduce violence more effectively by redeploying resources from police into other programs? If anyone wants to make a comment on that one, if they think you know that that's relevant for us at this at this point. All right. 
Well, I'll uh, I'll jump in there to say that I think that that is, uh, you know, the idea of having the social workers would be um, using your resources in different programs, right? That would cost something um, oh. if we did have an on-call social worker uh, program. So that would be important. Um, I think it's a little bit hard uh, for me as a lay person, um, perhaps some of the people who are, um, you know, more in the field of, of, uh, of, criminal justice or, or things like that uh, will know more, but I don't have any idea like the statistics on violent crime or things like that within the town of Mount Pleasant. Does, do you guys keep statistics on the kind of calls you go on? Um, you know, how many arrests you make a month or things like that. And is it possible for you to share that with us? So I'd be, I'd be happy to share it. Um, we, one of the, issues that we're having over the last few years. I've been struggling with the uh, records management system that we're using. And uh, it, there's several departments in um, in Westchester, uh, maybe 15, that use this same uh, records management system. And uh, it, the company's been bought and sold about five times in the last uh, five years. And um, it to be to say that the the search feature, which as a patrolman I never I didn't really care about, as long as I could input my information in and get an accident report back, uh, it was fine. But on a command level, an administrative level, when I need, uh, I'd like to get better statistics. This thing is horrible, and I'm, I'm not the only uh, police chief to complain about it. So we're actively in the process, along with some other departments, of trying to um, trying to uh, upgrade to a different records management system that will get us better statistics. Now that being said, there there are things that I can uh, search. Usually. Um, We'll do it calls for service, which could be anything from checking the school uh, to a traffic stop. Uh, we try to document everything. We, we're in a neighborhood of about 35,000 calls for service. That's pretty consistent, anywhere between 33 and 35,000 a year. Um, out of those uh, calls for service, some, some need more. Uh, it, we may open a case if we believe that there's a potential that a crime was committed, oh, whether it's uh, fraud or uh, okay. larceny or something. Uh, so we'll open a case, and and in a normal year, this year hasn't uh, hasn't been normal for everybody or anybody. I think um, normally we would do about 850 cases a year, um, which requires more you know, additional follow-up work and all that. And uh, um, so this year, I think we're only, in, the lieutenant might know a little better, he's on the call. Uh, I think we're in a 300 range um, uh, for uh, cases. Um, then typically uh, we would have anywhere from, we might do 300 arrests a year, 300, 300 to 350 arrests a year, and then maybe 50 juvenile arrests a year. There are some departments that would only do maybe one or two juvenile arrests or maybe zero uh, in a year. Um, but because we deal with the facilities, um, there the, our juvenile arrests were up a little bit more. And we don't go on campus looking for arrests, um, but there were times that the school wanted to prosecute or, or facilities wanted to prosecute. There's a lot of times that we'll go up there for a, a, a mental health call um, where a crime was committed, but it's really just a mental health call that we go on, so we don't make an arrest on that. Uh, but this year, I think we're down, we're way down, we're way way down with the uh, juvenile arrests also. So um, that's kind of how it how it shakes out. The arrest will, um, you know, I'm gonna knock on wood. We haven't had a, a well, I shouldn't say that, but but. but uh, you know, homicides, uh, like shootings or anything like that, we haven't uh, had in this year or for the past, uh, in, in my tenure, we haven't had that. Um, so 
uh, you know, we're prepared for it if it happens, but, but we haven't had any incidents like that. Um, let me see what else I can, I don't know what else I can, as far as accident reports, we, we do a lot of, uh, motor vehicle accident reports. Um, you know, we'll document them and do a, a state accident report. We're, uh, if there's injuries, we'll, we'll do that. And then we go on a lot of aided calls. Um, uh, we're usually first responders uh, for aided calls. So we have volunteer ambulances in town, so they're not driving around all the time. Um, we've contracted with with uh, advanced life support services. We have Westchester, uh, it's Wentz. Westchester Emergency Yeah, Westchester Emergency Services. Um, we're contracted with them and they give us paramedic services. So uh, it, depending on what, whether it's a transport basic life support or whether it requires advanced life support, uh, we have paramedics that work 24 seven that are assigned to the town. Um, there are times that we administer, you know, when we go on aided cases, sometimes it's just oxygen, uh, you know, to get someone prepared for a transport. Uh, sometimes it's uh, Narcan. Uh, we will um, we'll dispense Narcan because if someone's not breathing because of an opioid overdose, you know, seconds count. Um, so we'll, we've done that uh, multiple times. As a matter of fact, the first couple of times we did it, uh, you know, the officer, one officer got an award uh, for lifesaving from the state. I, we went up to Albany, they gave him an award. Uh, since then, it's been done so many times that it's not even a, a award worthy, I hate to say it, but it's just, you know, it's, uh, that's just the way that it's gone. Um, so we'll do, we do things like that. Um, so those are at least some of the, the, the functions, um, as far as, uh, soliciting from covering stuff. Well, I don't, that might cover, uh, also what functions, well, that's sort of what we're doing on 911 calls. Chief? Um, yes. Me, it's me. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Lieutenant Sean Ford. Uh, obviously, I, I work with uh, Chief Oliva. My office is two doors down. But Chief, if I could just interject a little bit onto that last point that you just brought up about um, are there other services that we could fund, you know, instead of more police officers? But before I answer that question, I just want to back it up a little bit because probably not everybody is aware that uh, back in around 2012, New York State Westchester County in particular uh, had financial issues going on. And one of the ways they circumvented their issues was cutbacks. And it was social services and behavioral health programs that took the hit. Uh, Westchester Medical Center in Bahala is our primary hospital for acute behavioral health care issues. They had, I emphasize had, uh, a behavioral health emergency room that no longer exists. Uh, when we when we do respond to behavioral health calls that, re that uh, require hospitalization, those people are now taken to the traditional ER to, to be medically cleared before being admitted to the behavioral health unit. Prior to those cutbacks, the county also had a mobile crisis team to do exactly what everybody is asking for today. If there was a person in distress suffering from a behavioral health emergency uh, in need of immediate intervention, this mobile crisis team would come out to the scene and address the issue at hand. And of course, we were there with them. But when these cuts were put in place, you know, that mobile team was eliminated. The behavioral health hospital staff was reduced the services were also significantly reduced and the police departments, not just Mount Pleasant, but the police departments all over the state were the ones who picked up the slack. And in Mount Pleasant, we picked up that slack without adding on any more staff. We didn't, in, the town did not incur uh, an additional debt or, or a fee or, you know, they didn't, they were unable to send all of us to the training to become um, crisis, mobile crisis workers. But the police academy did recognize the need for crisis intervention training and incorporated that into the basic program. And we still 
continue the training, but like the chief mentioned, you know, we run so lean, it's, you can only train, you know, maybe four or five officers at a time. So I just, I wanted you guys to realize that, that all these things that people are asking for once exist or once existed, but because of funding cuts, they're gone. And, you know, it, the police department is doing its best to, you know, provide to the community what it's asking for, but clearly we are not the answer in that, in that particular field. So um, we're doing on average for the last three years, 40,000 calls for service per year. So give or take a thousand, 39, 41,000. And Kelsey, to your question, do we keep statistics on it? I know the chief was explaining it's uh, our, our records management system is horrendous. We are looking at other offerings, but I will tell you that behavioral health calls are lumped in with all the other medical aided calls. And currently we cannot separate those out when we're doing data collection. So I, I wish we could, um, but uh, it, right now it's just not feasible. Thanks. Thanks. You see why it's important to hire smart people. <laughs> so it, Sean is a uh, is uh, really a, a great asset for the department, um, and I I lean on him heavily, and along with the other members of the command staff. But that's an important uh, lieutenant that I didn't bring up before. And you're right, we did have that option uh, for mobile crisis teams. It was. It's probably been out of service for quite a long time now, like you said. And uh, so maybe that's something that, that on a countywide basis, um, the county be willing to do. Or if they're not willing to do it, um, then maybe we can put resources, more highly trained officers, uh, or, you know, towards that problem and, uh, and see if we can. I mean, we do a pretty we do a pretty good job at de-escalating now. It's it's uh, so even the regular patrol officers are good at it. They they uh, you know if you're not good at de-escalation, you're going to be fighting with people every day because people are general. You know they can be. We're dealing with them when they are in crisis or they're angry or there's people just don't call the police for no reason. Uh, so they they uh, the officers do a, a good job. Can we always do better? Yes, I'm a firm believer in in uh, all continuous improvement, um, and, and we want to do better. We want to serve better, but they're they're doing pretty good right now, and, and uh, so we'll see. Um, you know what the what the county has option wise, or maybe what what we can what we can do with the um, the safety aspect for putting a civilian out on the street to respond. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little, it's definitely tricky. There's some pitfalls there as far as, as safety goes. And, and that concerns me, you know, not just here, but countrywide if people start, uh, you know, if they start doing that. So, um, but it, it's definitely something to uh, think about. Hey, Chief, um, if I may add one more thing, um, when it comes to putting social workers out on the street, a neighboring community in Rockland County, town of Ramapo, was one of the first to implement uh, putting social workers out on the street with police. And in August of this year, you can Google it under Ramapo police. August of this year, uh, Ramapo responded to uh, an emotionally disturbed person call. I believe it was a 15 year old boy. Uh, an officer escorted a social worker to the scene and that social worker was promptly assaulted. She was tackled into a dresser and beaten pretty severely. The officer intervened. He too took a beating uh, before they finally got it under control. But the, there seems to be uh, a void when people are thinking about where are my healthcare workers? When, when you think about environment of care and the police do not work. We don't function in a controlled environment like most social workers do. So to put a social worker out in an environment that they're not accustomed to, that they are not trained to function within is a recipe for disaster. So you know, the, the wish list is growing, but I think ultimately um, what people are looking for, they haven't really conceived the idea completely yet because 
I don't think putting social workers out on the street is really the answer. Uh, again, because there's a lack of control uh, at that point in time. So. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I had a follow-up question about uh, about stats, but I first I'd like to say don't EMTs and firefighters aren't they there on the scene? Like I understand what you're saying, like going into a house and all that, but we do have other non-police first responders who interact with the public. Um, you know, what, what we'll do in uh, in a case where where there might be danger is we'll ask um, um, EMS to stage there, and uh, so they will stage not at the location but right nearby. And usually the police officers will make sure that the scene is safe because we don't want the EMTs, you know, their volunteer ambulance, and we don't want our paramedics paramedics getting getting injured either so the police officers will go secure the scene and then and then they'll clear uh, medical services to, to come in so they are there typically our, our fire fire departments don't respond to eight calls because they're volunteer um, so they're not you know in, in some places where the fire service is full-time uh, they'll respond to eight calls and the police won't um, but we don't have a fire so, uh, so the police roll on on all of the ADA calls, and it's been working well for us. Um, you know, so far, if there is a danger, we ask EMS to stage, and then uh, make sure everything's secure, and then we have them come in so they can uh, so they can do their thing. Sure, and I hear what uh, Lieutenant Ford is saying that, like, if you want social workers who are capable of responding with the police, you're going to need to train them in order to do that to be actually mobile crisis intervention people yep. um and i hear that too okay statistics question um do you keep uh track of demographic data that would be important um for you or for the public to see to um make sense of whether or not you know the stops of say uh uh i don't know black people in our uh town uh like you know uh uh, uh Sorry, I'm losing my words right now. Uh, <laughs> you pull someone over in a car for for whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. If that's you know commiserate to the actual population numbers we have, or if we're seeing that a certain type of person gets stopped more often, that kind of data. I don't know. Do you one keep that, and two, can it be publicly available? And then three, when it's more serious offensives, I uh, 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 more serious calls or or things, it seems like that data would become even more important in arrests. But I don't. There might be like privacy concerns. I don't know. Is any of that kept? And in the future, uh, as you are looking to make a new system, would you want to keep that? And three, would you want to make it public? Uh, so starting with three, and uh, I have no problem, uh, you know, making things public. Um, the uh, we do currently um, we have to do uh, uniform crime reports. Uh, so the software is pretty good at the at the UCRs uniform uniform crime reports that uh, is like an FBI statistic. That, uh, so I do have some stats on that. When I was looking at it, as far as arrest uh, went, it was you know over the last four or five years, um, it, it looked pretty good. I will post those. Up. I'll scan them and. Uh, and I can post them so the committee can look at it, and I guess eventually the public, I guess if they want to, if they want to see it. It didn't look like there was, you know, any disparity. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we have a pretty big um, transient population. One of the great things about Mount Pleasant is it's uh, centrally located. One of the internal jokes with the department is all roads lead to Mount Pleasant because someone could have issues somewhere else, and what. Somehow they they end up in Mount Pleasant, and uh, so but that's due to the fact that we have several parkways. Um, we do not patrol the parkways, but it, it is a, a pretty big thoroughfare, uh, you know, uh, in getting from one place to the other. Um, we have a, a good size of commercial uh, population, commercial district businesses, um, so we get a transient population that comes in during the day. Um, but even all that being said, looking at the numbers that I had, as far as arrests, um, excuse me, it seemed to be 
it was it the numbers didn't jump out and uh and, and look like anything was bad. I will say a few years ago, uh there was an article in uh maybe probably five years ago in the journal news that our um our African American arrests were were uh higher than you know, one of the higher numbers in the Hudson Valley or the highest number. And uh, the reporter called me and was concerned and asked for comment. But at the time, um, we had uh, Hawthorne Cedar Knowles had a, either 90 or 120 residents. Um, Plesmo Cottage School, I think, had more residents at the time than they do now. And and uh, I guess the, the school was requesting more arrests be made. Um, so it, it definitely, it threw our, our statistics uh, way up, you know, as far as arrests of people of color. But we didn't, I, we, we weren't looking for that. We were responding to calls for service and, uh, and reacting to, um, you know, what the, what the victims wanted in, in the cases of the school or whether it's staff members or, or whatever wanted to, you know, pursue charges. So. Um, since then, the numbers are, are down. Uh, you know, the, the, I think the facilities are handling a lot more as uh, as mental health um, calls and and uh, you know any damage done to the property is more like the cost of doing business for them. And, and uh, that, that's what it seems to be for me. Maybe the lieutenant have, might have a little uh, more to add on that, but but it definitely our, our arrest numbers are are down. Um, as far as uh, uh, the facilities are concerned. So, but I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, I can post those uh, crime statistics um, so that people can see. Uh, I have no issue with that. And, and we will, our hope is that we can find a software that's uh, a lot easier to search and we can get the things out of it that, that we'd like to get. And, uh, and if that's one of the things that can come out of, that helps come out of police reform or we can keep better track of, of things that people are, the public's interested in, I'm, I'm on board with that. I think we're all on board. So thank you. Okay. Uh, just bouncing back. I know we, we hit, um, we hit this question a little bit last week. Um, when I was explaining the kind of about what we did um, with the schools and that we had uh, a school resource. Well, we have two uh, officers in the youth division. Oh, in addition, we have some patrol officers. We have, uh, I think it's six. We've sent some additional ones to school um, for school resource officers. And their, I, the idea was to have them uh, pop in and out of the schools. I, I wasn't a big fan of of sitting an officer in a school, um, you know, during school hours all the time, just sitting in an office. Or um, I would rather that you rotated different officers in and out, and uh, that they just had a relationship with um, with the school staff and the uh, and the kids. But so at least it, it humanized the police, um, and that if there was uh, a child that thought that they had a friend that might need might need help or was exhibiting behavior that might be threatening, you know, to, uh, to the rest of the school community, that that they would feel comfortable enough to come to the to the school resource officer and say, "Hey, I think my friend needs help," and, and trust them enough to do that. Uh, other than having some sort of presence in the schools, I'm, I'm not sure how to had to uh, accomplish that. Um, and I know, you know, I, Kelsey, I looked into, I know you had said that, that, or maybe Claire Degnan had said that it was, a, um, you know, police in the schools is a pipeline to jail. But I was trying to think of, of any uh, instance where, you know, where we just were pushing our, our student population into jail. And I, I, I couldn't find anything, so I don't. I don't know if uh, I. I think we're doing okay with it. I don't want an over presence in the schools because our our job is public safety, and obviously we're uh, we're trying to uh, do the best we can with the resources that we that we have. And um, 
but I thought that at least having some sort of presence in schools was uh, was beneficial, um, and that it was working, and that we weren't, you know, we're not going in, kicking in doors, and taking kids out of class and handcuffs, and we don't do truancy or or anything, and, and we we go work extra hard to make sure that the school resource officers are not, uh, you know, arresting people in the school. We we because then that would um it would be counterproductive to what we were what we're trying to accomplish, which is have a positive relationship and, and image of want kids to to trust the police and and possibly possibly even it's an avenue to recruit some people if they if they thought that it was a line of work that they would want to get into. So uh, so uh, um, I'd be interested to hear. Maybe we'll go through and see what. Uh, just want what, to make a point. Uh, what people <clears throat> what just a, a comment on the school thing it's not that you are pushing your officers to go to school the school is requesting the assistance from the police department yeah so it's not like you're imposing your officers on the schools it's a request from the schools yes i don't want people to think that we just automatically send police officers to school to watch over students that's not the case no they they wanted uh the the uh, schools have wanted our presence there and, and uh, have come to sort of expect it. And uh, there's, I, you know, uh, different schools have thought on the effectiveness of the DARE program and, and we've modified ours, um, but I, I may uh, shelf that program in, in lieu of, uh, of having the SRO or the school resource officers you know, pop in and out um, of the school. So let me, uh, you know what, let's start with the, uh, let me start with, with uh, Mike Cunzio because he's a principal from um, Mount Pleasant Central School District just to get uh, your thought and then we'll go around and, and speak to others. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, uh, Chief. <clears throat> you know, certainly I, I think all of the, the things you said are certainly indicative of our, of our relationship with uh, the Mount Pleasant Police. I think they're a regular part of our school community. Um, and I think I probably said it last week, they you know, participate in, in our safety drills from, from lockdowns, evacuations, um, fire drills, um, you, know, you know, those types of, of regular things where the kids are accustomed um, to, to seeing the police in, in that role. You know, so if there was an actual emergency that they know what to expect. Um, you, you know, in, in those terms, um, you know, the officers come and, and go door to door with us when we're ending a lockdown. So, so the children see them and know that's part of, of what, what they do. Um, certainly, you know, routine police kind of things that they help us with, uh, you know, traffic. I mean, this year in, in particular, uh, our, our traffic flow and patterns is very, very different. So, you know, the, their, their help at the beginning of the year particularly was, you know, essential the kind of getting uh, the, the routines down. Um, you know, it's been many years since I've been in our middle school, uh, 13 years, so I, I can't speak much to the D.A.R.E. program uh, at this point anymore. But I mean, they're, they come to the school and again, a little bit different this year um, and, and do safety programs, Halloween safety, you know, all of those types of things. Um, and, and I know for, for the older kids at, at the high school, it's, uh, you know, they, they feel comfortable, I think, coming to, to with having relationship with the officers. If, they, if there is a concern, um, you know, we want the, the kids, whether it's police, us as school administrators, um, you know, to be able to come forward if they have a concern. And, and I've been in the district 19 years. I, I cannot recall once in, in all of my 19 years a, a student ever being taken out of the school in, in handcuffs. Doesn't I could have forgotten, but I, I, I don't recall that. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. It, and I've, I've been around for a while now. Um, so, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's a it's an important re relationship for the kids. The, I, I think a thing we need now with the uh, is uh, some bicycle safety. I see these, uh, these kids now out uh, riding bikes more than ever before. So probably could use some bicycle uh, safety enforcement <laughs> um, as something to look at. But uh you know, again, we, we have a great relationship and we're certainly appreciative of, of everything they do for the school community. Thank you. Um, down here. Frank Luis, are you there still, Frank? Uh, 
Just one second, Chief. Uh, we're going to unmute you, Frank. Just accept that unmute request, please. You're all set, Mr. Luis. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was distracted there by family. Can somebody repeat the question, please? Yeah, no problem. Frank, we're looking to um, just the question is, uh, should law enforcement have a presence in schools? And I know that you represent the uh, Northern Westchester Bureau of the DA's office. So I don't know what's your, well, personally, what's your thought? And then maybe professionally, uh, what's your experience in, in what other uh, school districts are doing and, and uh, what you might be familiar with? Okay, so um, by way of personal background, the Chief's already introduced me as the branch chief assigned to a number of jurisdictions, including Mount Pleasant. And that's why I was invited to be a representative on this committee. Uh, in terms of personal knowledge, as a parent, I live up in Cortland. And so in the Hen Hud schools, they use New York State police officers as resource officers. And the way it was explained to parents, and as a parent there over the years, it was not only to provide a, a sense of, of safety to parents concerned after seeing incidents of violence at random schools across the country, but as the chief said, to also uh, make them available in the event a child has nowhere else to turn and needs help either for themselves or for a peer. So with those goals in mind, um, I personally, as, as a parent in Westchester, don't have an issue with uh, police officers being in school as a resource. Um, and again, I should also add that similarly to what was described here, uh, the school, uh, our local schools asked for the resource officer to be made available to them. So it's not a question of uh, the New York State Police intruding into the schools. Um, in terms of cases, I understand that I was present at the meeting last week when Claire uh, Dagnan expressed some concerns about it being a pipeline uh, of, of leading children into further contacts with the police as adults. I have not seen that on a personal level. Uh, though I imagine that she has statistics from somewhere that would back up that assertion. But the problem is our communities are so different across the country not only across Westchester, that you don't necessarily want to set policy in Mount Pleasant or Cortland based on statistics arising out of New York City or LA or any other community that differs greatly from us. Um, those, are my, those are my thoughts on that issue. Okay, thank you. That was enlightening. Thank you. Um, I don't think Claire is on the call. Uh, um, we got Margarita, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I know that you, your child attends the public schools and then I know there was some discussion on, uh, on, on maybe the, having officers at the, in the school buildings at the facility. So, um, what, are, what, what are your thoughts on that? In the school or at the facility? Cause the school's well, a separate entity. Yeah, but, well, I would say, I guess we're talking about officers in school. So I would say at Pleasant Oak Cottage School, that the actual school building, um, and then and then your experience, you know, as, as being a, a mom, or what, you, what you're thinking. Um, I, I um, think that it's a, it's a start um, in terms of building relationships with police officers. Um, I do know that working at um, Lincoln, Lincoln and Watts some time ago, about 10 years ago or so in Yonkers, it was also a residential facility, um, residential treatment center in Yonkers, um, that they do have a very good uh, relationship with the third precinct, which is right literally around the corner. Um, and the officers did frequently visit our facility there. Um, they even used our campus for training at times with the police officers. So um, they were frequently there building relationships, not only with the youth, but with the staff. So when they did have to respond to an urgent situation, they really knew our residents and our staff on first name basis and vice versa, um, because that's how you build the 
the relationship. So I think that some of the ideas uh, such as like, you know, evacuation and fire drills and things of that nature would um, definitely go a long way. I, I do like the um, idea of having some school officers, um, maybe even doing some trainings with the kids, dare trainings or things like that. Um, I know that that hasn't probably, I don't, do we have a dare officer chief? Uh, we, we do, there's, uh, there's, I have a few officers trained um, in dare. Uh, this year has been a little bit of a, it's been a challenge, um, but it's, it's one of the programs that we were uh, that we were actively involved in. Um, the unfortunate part is the there's been a, a lot of studies that say that um, that there isn't as effective as what they thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I asked our staff to maybe try to adapt the program so that it was a little more relevant. Um, you know, we we uh, we do um, one of the other things that we'll we'll do. Uh, is respond to um, underage drinking. We take it real seriously. I, I really think that, you know, going back to, uh, to um, the incident 10 years ago uh, where that young man was shot, um, it was, uh, I think the main cause of it was, um, was the fact that there was underage drinking going on in one of the bars in town. Um, we had, if we had a failure, uh, as a department, it, I would say it was um, not responding effectively to that. The weekend before, they shut the bar down because they're underage drinking. But uh, I think we could have done better because they were open again. It was homecoming weekend. Anyway. Um, I, Chief, because I have yeah. to get off at 8 o'clock, I do want to also say that um, we may you may want to look into also some training and restorative practices, if that hasn't already um, been explored because it's been, um, research has shown that restorative practices have been very effective. Um, um, and we may wanna look at going that route as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm not doing the talk and let me keep going. Uh, Reverend uh, Dave, um, What's your feeling on, on uh, having law enforcement presence in the school? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to remember our, our preschool, our congregation has a uh, preschool. Um, I don't handle that, but I know that the police, uh, some officers come in. The kids love it, of course, at that age. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's, uh, you know, one of the ways in which it's, uh, a community police force, uh, making those connections. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, do we limit it to schools? I mean, there are other venues where police could be interacting with uh, groups of people uh, of all ages. Sure. Including, uh, you know, youth groups, uh, Civic associations, um, and I, I think that sometimes that that is carried out by the fact that police officers living within Mount Pleasant also may be members of of different organizations and sports uh, organizations, um, so they they're representing the police at even as they're personally uh, involved in those organizations. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> it's fine. No problem. No, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe we'll make it a, a little more. I mean, we we try, uh, at least at my level, I try to have relationships. Um, but maybe that's something we could push for, for uh, not just the schools, but in general. Um, you know, you don't want... To, you don't want the uh, only contact you have with the police to be when you get pulled over for a traffic violation or if you have an incident. Um, you know, we, we could do a better job at, uh, at, at maybe interacting on a positive level. We, we, we try, uh, you know, to do what we can, but we, I'm sure we can do better at that. So thank you. And, you know, I think the, the public uh, by and large would be very interested to hear from, from the police. 
I know in our congregation, we have a, a speaker series uh, public forum. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had some of our uh, civic leaders and politicians. And I, I think, you know, people would want to hear from the police. You know, and I think that kind of dovetails into what Dr. Smittle was saying earlier was that, um, you know, to, to, to sort of showcase. Um, so maybe instead of using the Internet, where which makes me a little uh, bristly, uh, you know, for as far as everyone can see it. But but to have uh, the ability for the community to at least be able to see who these, uh, you know, who the officers are and uh and not just have it be the chief that goes to a, a meeting. Yeah, I, I really, I'm I really am very proud of the uh, of the officers that work here, and they they really uh, they come they do come from different backgrounds. And I got one officer who's got a chemistry degree, and you know they're not all just criminal justice majors, and uh, they're very well rounded and uh, and very smart. And uh, I got a guy that's got an engineering degree. He's a civil engineer, and uh, or I guess he just has to sit for the exam. But I, you know, I have some good, smart people that uh, that I can get the opportunity for them, so the the uh, community can really know who they are. So uh, that I like that I I like that idea. One of the one of the areas where we interact a lot is the, at the deli down the street. <laughs> Everybody goes to the deli. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, what do we got here? Um, Chief, uh, I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to remind you it's just about 8 p.m. Wow. Okay. Uh, let me just get a comment from the rest of them on this. And then... Uh, and... <coughs> okay. You got it. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. We're going to just, uh, I'm going to hit, um, just ask for comment quick. We'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, but uh, Kelsey, did you have anything? I know that um, we did speak about it before and you weren't a big proponent of having a presence in the school, but I mean, just based on what you're here, um, uh, what do you well, think? I know that you're saying based in our community, we don't really see you know, police presence in the school leading to harsher punishment on uh, minorities or leading to, you know, the kind of thing where a kid gets in trouble in school, he gets arrested, blah, 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 leads him to end up in sort of a um, prison, uh, school to prison pipeline situation. We're not seeing that in our community, but I will ask you, are we seeing the benefits of the SROs that we are saying that we want? Are we seeing that kids will go to the cops and say, hey, my friend is building a pipe bomb or whatever. Um, you know, of course, we would never want that sort of thing to happen. But I'm saying, like, you know, if we're going to dispute the cons, we also need to look at the, the pros that we're asking for and saying, do those things actually happen? Um, otherwise, it's, you know, I don't know that there is a relationship building that's happening. Um, I mean, personally, when I was in high school, the cop came around, everybody felt scared and worried. Um, and I, you know, I didn't grow up here. Um, I didn't go to the Mount Pleasant high schools, but I don't know that you're gonna have minority students feeling like super comfortable with cops, especially with everything else going on in the world right now, you know? Um, so I just would question the benefits that we're, we're, we're stating that we want. I think that they're great benefits to want, but do they actually happen or occur? You know? Sure. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry, everybody. I have to get off the call. No problem. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Hopefully, Margarita. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, worth it. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, it's going to be up to us to raise the comfort level between our police department and minorities. For sure. Do they do feel more comfortable? No, absolutely. I don't know if, uh, if Connie's on the call still. Uh, oh no! All right. Mr. Sorry, Chief. Can I can I just ask that this be a question we put on the survey as well? The survey to the public is to yeah. ask people if they want cops in their schools. Okay. Well, that has to be defined. What 
not a blanket statement like that. Of course. Yeah, it would have to be more specific than that. But I think that that's something good to ask in a survey. Because again, like I said, we, we're not having a, a huge demographical difference represented here on this committee. Yeah, I put uh, the supervisor had said before, and, and um, there obviously this is something that's been going on for years. Uh, you know, um, I don't know if it's if it obviously it started. I'm 32 years on uh, Mount Pleasant Police, but we've uh, we've had that presence probably for most of my career. But a lot of it is because the schools want it, um, and they kind of expect it now. That doesn't mean that we can't, um, you know, what question it and and see if, if it still uh, make, makes sense to do it. Um, but and and that's definitely a question that we can uh, that we can ask in the survey. But up to this point, it's almost like my discussion. You, you know, the schools had approached us pre-COVID and uh, and wanted someone in the school like all day long and, and a dedicated officer there. I'm like, wow. So uh, they were looking to go the other direction. So uh, rather than just have an officer pop in and be, you know, be familiar. So, uh, so but, but we could definitely explore that. And uh, I, I don't have an issue with that. No, no problem. Um, let me just get to everybody here. I don't know if Mr. Swosey is still on there. Uh, and, uh, and Tom uh, Milliot, I don't know if you're on still. Oh, I'm still here, listening. Yes. Okay, gotcha. All right, hang on. Let me get to Mr. Sposey here. What do you think about uh, the presence of, the, of police in schools, Mr. Sposey? I'm not so sure uh, I would want to see a police officer in a school, especially on a high school level. I think at that level, um, uh, I think Kelsey said, uh, uh, if I saw a police officer in a school, I would think that they're there on an investigation or somebody's in trouble. I, I know I never see police officers walking the beat and it's hard to walk a beat in a suburban area like this, but I was just wondering, Chief, do the officers have authority, uh, say if they were patrolling through um, uh, Rose Hill or ShopRite to park the squad car and get out and just walk up and down and, and intermingle with, with the citizens, try to make some conversation, especially after school is out, when the kids are hanging out in those places. So they do have the authority to do that. We used to call that 1046. And then you were out of the car and walking around. Um, we went through a period of time where, where or we were down a lot of resources. So one, one uh, officer patrol cars are the most efficient. Uh, so we probably were in a period of time of maybe 10 or more years where where we just didn't have the time for it because we didn't have the, the manpower. Uh, but we have, we did initiate some, uh, some bicycle patrols. So um, when the weather's nice, we'll have uh, a couple of officers on bicycles, you know, one at a time, but they'll, they'll get out. And uh, that got a, a lot of positive feedback. I, I was shocked about that, but people really liked it. And, that, and um, we used to encourage it. And, and maybe it's something that we got away from because it's where, you know, uh, we were trying to do other things, but, but that's definitely an opportunity. Uh, I don't know if we could really do the beat cop thing anymore, but, but just to get out of the car and interact with the public. I used to love it. That was my favorite part to be able to do that and to talk to people, uh, go figure. Right. But, uh, but this, this uh, is why I, I brought this up, uh, I'm not a police officer. I spend a lot of time in vehicles, but I think if I was, I would like to have that ability to get out and carry on conversation with people. And uh, especially with the kids, middle school kids, I think, you know, are potentially the most problems when they get a few years older. And that's the key, the key age that uh, I would think that uh, uh, the officers want to engage in. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then just tell um, Yes, as you know, uh, I was pretty involved in those uh, street fairs that we had and uh, the, the result of having your police force involved and that's where they use their bicycles. I think that was very well received. 
and uh, bringing some security to a public event like that is uh, very important and it's great time for community interaction. So I can take a couple more questions for uh, where we can and then we'll see we'll hit it next week. Or yeah, we're, okay, we're, we're already over a little bit and I, I know everyone's time is valuable, um, but I, I there was some really, I thought productive ideas there and, uh, and um, that's what this is about. And uh, so I'll make some notes on it and then eventually I have to have a, a report, final report and, and we have to make some decisions. But um, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, yeah, if, if anyone has any um, additional comments while it's fresh in your head, if you, uh, if you wanted to email um, the police reform at and mppleasantny.com and, uh, and float it out there. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that email is available. And, um, and I think that's all we got. We got a meeting next week. I will, we're going to wrap up just the tail end of the uh, couple of questions in this first, uh, first block, and then we'll hit uh, the second block. I will uh, forward those questions to you so you have them. They're actually in that workbook, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send them out so that or I'll prepare to send them out. I think uh, people a lot smarter than me are going to be able to send it. They'll blast it out on the on the town website, and I can email it to the to the group. So, um, with that being said, uh, on behalf of the supervisor, thank you very much for your participation tonight, and uh, look forward to to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a good, good night. night.